I'm really glad that you're with us for the second half of the first session of The Cross at the Center, The Faith of Lutheran Christians. So in the first part, I talked a bit about what the scripture is for us. The sec in this second phase, I want to focus instead on uh, how we use the Bible and the kinds of things we should think about in our own use of scripture, both personally and collectively as a church. And I hope that in this, uh, I'll provoke some good conversation for you to have in your local settings. <coughs> the Holy Scriptures and the Bible, as you see, you've heard, are slightly different things. The texts themselves as a collection, the Bible is the book that contains all the texts. These are at the very heart of what Christians know about God. As I said before, especially God's self-revelation in Jesus Christ. Martin Luther and the Protestant tradition have always stressed the importance of Scripture over and against other ways of human knowing about God. Sorry. I'll start over. We have a little microphone now. And the problem was with the user, not the equipment. As I said in the first session, the Holy Scriptures and the Bible that contains them are at the very heart of, the, of what Christians know about God, especially God's self-revelation in Jesus Christ. Martin Luther and the Protestant tradition have always stressed the importance of Scripture over and against other ways of human knowing about God, like reason and experience and history. To many Christians over the centuries, what has often seemed like an objectively real and unchanging words of a text were more, seemed more reliable and certain as a way of knowing about God than the experiences of the human community, the human family in history, or the structures of human authority could carry forward. At least this was the principle that Luther applied when he insisted that the Christian church could not insist that individual believers believe important truths about God or the church that could not be found in and defended from Scripture. That which the church expects the faithful to believe must be found in Scripture. There are many things that people might believe and things that people want to do, but if the church is going to require them or expect them of those who belong to the Christian community, they must be demonstrable from Scripture itself. This was a bit of a shift from what had gone before, but it was just the beginning. Other reformers went even further than Luther. The Bible became for them not just the center of Christianity, but also the border of Christianity, so that anything that could not be found in Scripture became questionable and suspicious, in a sense, at least within the church. The Bible became, for some, not just the center, but even the outside boundary of faith. And slogans like, Scripture alone, became their watchword. Even Lutherans have been known to use this slogan although Martin Luther himself never did. And in this lecture, I hope to clarify for you how much richer and more nuanced a Lutheran understanding of Scripture is than just that slogan. But that comes out of the Reformation era, a time in which the battle lines were sharply drawn and the divisions and, and challenges complex. Everyone in the Reformation, on whatever side, was defending what they saw as a true interpretation of God's will for humankind. Some, the traditional faith, saw this defense as being best based in the church's long tradition, in its established patterns of authority. Others, like Luther and the other Protestants, often saw these 
ancient customs as being part of the problem. And they in turn lifted up scripture as an unchanging and objective reality by which other aspects of the faith and the life of the church could be judged and evaluated and ultimately reformed and reestablished. So these two positions in their extreme forms could be characterized as Catholic and Protestant ends of the theological perspective in the Reformation era on the subject of scripture. But the ultimate question for everyone was, how do we know what God wants of us? And how are we to, to define our life together in the church and hold on to a faith that unites us? And for almost everyone, ultimately, the battleground for answers to these questions was the Bible. How should we hear God's voice? in scripture? How do we know that we're reading it correctly? The extreme Catholic answer was that we never know for sure unless we have help. Mm -hmm. The wisdom of the community manifested by those who have been put in authority. This larger community, the church, could always be trusted to keep the faith for all and to pass it on authentically to each new generation. The extreme Protestant answer to the question was that all we need is scripture and that each believer should individually be able to come to a right understanding of God through their own direct encounter with the scriptural texts. As I say, these are extremes. Their postures, truth claims. But in point of fact, most Christian churches and believers fall somewhere in between, neither totally giving themselves over to the opinions of other authorities or relying entirely on their own interpretation. But this lays bare the basic question. How do we trust and how do... How do we trust the truth about God to be best preserved and best understood? And how do we have the best access to that? How can we learn it? Again, it was Martin Luther whose views and teaching have most strongly influenced Lutheran understanding of the scriptures as the source and the standard for Christian teaching. And, and this is even more complicated, as the norm for Christian life. But Lutherans have not been entirely consistent as a community, and among us today, there are still variations and differences of emphasis that relate to our context and experience, and which themselves have changed over time in the 500 years since Luther. The basic way Luther approaches the question of how to understand scripture best, how to judge the quality of your scriptural interpretation, is to look within the scriptures themselves for answers to the question of how to interpret scripture, to find an interpretive framework for teaching about the scripture within the text itself. It's Luther's most basic and lasting insight that we as believers are caught in an in-between situation. We have been given what we need to know, but we don't know everything. So our thinking about God is always a blend of confidence and uncertainty. We know enough to trust God without ever being able fully to understand God. There's always a barrier between divine reality and human understanding. God in the fullness of who God is is not something that humans, in the limitations of what humans are, can know. There is always something more 
to be revealed. For Luther, the Bible becomes the place where the powerful and trustworthy revelation of God meets the uncertain, incomplete understanding of humans. And because of this, the human interpretation of divine truth always involves a tension between our desires and our abilities. We long for certainty. What God gives us is a promise. And in this life, we're caught between what God offers and what we are able to understand. Luther borrows from St. Paul the distinction between the letter and the spirit of God's revelation in Scripture. Not everyone reads the same text to the same effect. It takes more than hearing or reading the words to make them come to life. We encounter the unchanging scriptures with very rapidly, constantly changing hearts and minds. So what we find in them is also constantly changing along with us. We rely on God's help to understand what we are already capable of reading. And without that help in understanding, we not only fail to grasp what Scripture is about, we might actually be alienated further from God by our failure to understand. Paul puts it really drastically. He says the letter, that is, the words without understanding, kills. But the Spirit gives life. In both cases, the text is the same. Parallel to this, Luther also developed a now famous distinction between law and gospel in interpreting scripture. This is frequently misunderstood as a, as a difference between the Old Testament in which God's laws repeatedly fail to tame a willful humanity and the New Testament in which a message of love and forgiveness reconciles God and humanity. To see law and gospel in this way is a careless assumption because both testaments contain both judgment and mercy. And carelessly applied, this misunderstanding can actually be very harmful by associating pre-Christian Judaism with empty legalism and promoting prejudice against Jews. When, for example, the Gospels lift up the Pharisees as opponents of Jesus, they tempt us to make the prejudices of early Christians our own. But the real enemy in the story is not the struggle of Jews to be faithful to their own tradition, but everyone's own internal tendency toward legalism and judgment. What law and gospel really means is not just that scripture shows us a God who is both judge, both a judger and merciful, but that what we read on the pages matters, truly matters when it reaches our hearts. And that we understand that we ourselves are constantly and simultaneously accepting and rejecting God's promises. You can't take two different colored highlighters and mark up a Bible to show the law parts in one color and the gospel parts in another. And of course, gospel used in this sense is about the good news of the saving work of Christ. It has nothing to do with the four gospels themselves. You can't do this. You can't separate them out because the same text is sometimes the one and sometimes the other and sometimes both <coughs> depending on what we need to hear what the text needs to do for us 
to bring God to where we are. The example that's easiest to use of this for Luther, because he says this himself, is that the first commandment, I am the Lord your God, and you'll have no other gods beside me. This is, at the same time, the most perfect expression of the law. God tells us who God is. God tells us that we are not God. That we are, we are creatures. And that God is the God above us. So it puts this gap between us and gives us a God who is other than us. And by implication, a God to whose standards we must live. So it condemns us in this extended way. Our job becomes that of being the right kind of creature to a God who is beyond us. So that is law. We hear that and we know we have something we have to do to please God. But Luther would go on to say that when God says, I am the Lord your God, God is also saying that God belongs to us and we belong to God. I am the Lord your God. I'm not someone else's God. I am your God. I am the God to whom you are connected forever. And that is gospel, because it connects us and makes us part of God's story forever. So this is an example of how something it would be very easy just to say, it's one of the Ten Commandments, it's part of the law, it is the heart of the law, in fact, is also the heart of the gospel at the same time, and in the Old Testament, so it doesn't even speak of Jesus. But implied in that being God for us, is the whole story of Jesus being the manifestation of God for us, at least in Luther's understanding that everything in Scripture that is gospel points us to Christ. When we have a... When we are selfish and complacent and self-satisfied, what we need to hear from Scripture might be judgment. When we are despairing and fearful and anxious what we need to hear is reassurance and hope and we might find that anywhere in scripture the part of our understanding that turns our reading and studying of scripture into a critique of ourselves is law and the parts that reveal to us God's love and lead us to serve our neighbor that's gospel so Luther is asking us to read and hear Scripture with humility and openness. And that if what we hear makes us uncomfortable, that might actually be the point. But we should never forget that the overarching message of the Bible is one of God's generous, liberating love for all creation. Humans, in our anxiety to have answers for our questions, in our longing to get things right and to know for sure, are always tempted to lock Scripture's meaning down too fast. But God's story can't be hemmed in by human conclusions and captured in human explanations. Luther's own ways of explaining the scripture are always ones that try to recognize both human selfishness and divine generosity as being constantly in play together. And when we study scripture, we all hear the same words, but we don't all hear them the same way. Because each of us is in a different place in this balance between our understanding of our own limitations and God's generosity. How we understand what we hear says much more about us than it does about the text itself. <coughs> Luther likes to keep us on this distinction between human limits and God's limitlessness. In making the famous analogy that the scriptures are like the manger in which the infant Jesus is laid, he's trying to make clear to us 
that no matter how well we know the Bible, it is knowing Christ that saves us and opens us to a new reality. The Bible is a human thing that with the Holy Spirit's help brings the saving truth of God's love and mercy to needy and broken human beings. The Bible has to be human so that humans can hear it in the same way that Jesus had to become human in order that humans could see God. It must be able, though, to bear the divine within it in order to change human hearts. But the manger is never to be confused with the child. Humans are often not satisfied with this insight. We want a greater level of certainty to still the restlessness in our hearts. And our weakness and fearfulness sometimes make us cling to Scripture in unhelpful ways and to press it into unsuitable uses. The Bible is not an encyclopedia with a definition and an answer for everything. It is not a universal rule book with a moral judgment for every dilemma. And it is certainly not a crystal ball into which we can look for answers to our personal questions. But because of our humanness, our uncertainty, and our anxiety, we are often tempted to make the Bible into these things. That's a dangerous and unhelpful path and says much more about our weakness than it does about God's power. But to some degree, and I think this is one of Luther's other important insights, it is effectively inevitable that we will do this. We can only come to Scripture as we are. Limited, self-absorbed, fearful, and driven by emotion. Until they are read or spoken, the words of Scripture mean nothing. God has not imprinted them on the stars. They are there in the book for human consumption, created through human means, through human words, human language, on paper and ink, fabricated by human hands. All of these things are human devices transmitting messages that are meant for human ears and for human hearts. And that is how we meet them. We can never separate ourselves, our sinful humanity, from our attempts to approach the scriptural text. We find within it what we are able to find as we are right now and as God wants us to know through the Holy Spirit. Sometimes, and I'm sure you can relate to this when we read the scriptures, we are alert and awake and sometimes we are sleepy. Sometimes we're calm and sometimes afraid. And every time, in every way, we may hear or see something different. The Bible can be, for us, a little bit like a mirror or a reflecting pool. And when we are closed up on ourselves and on God, it may well be closed to us. In the modern day, science has opened up to us worlds that our ancestors couldn't see. This has, of course, been happening for centuries, and it was even true in Luther's time 500 <coughs> years ago. Not long after his life, the microscope made it possible to see a whole world of microbes and bacteria that the naked eye could not see. A whole world that had not been visible before became apparent to humans. And on the other end of the spectrum, telescopes, more pieces of brass and polished glass, showed humans that the stars were not just painted on the sky like a great screen, but had depth and distance 
The mathematics of astronomy proved that the movement of the heavenly bodies was not random, but systematic, even when the system wasn't apparent at first. The deeper science delved, the clearer the patterns became. And those, as you know, are just the beginning. Now we have looked inside the atom and the chromosome, and we know incalculably more than our ancestors did. And that knowledge has changed us. We expect more certainty than we ever have before. And we are impatient with the limits of our knowledge. I believe this has a very profound effect on our way of looking at our faith. Over and against all this science and technology, which, predict, which depends on predictability and consistency, our faith is still based on ancient stories of great beauty and deep truth, <coughs> but ones that you can't just force into modern categories of information and analysis. But somehow, still, sometimes we try. Bible scholars have spent centuries trying to find the best early manuscripts of biblical texts, sometimes in the kind of unspoken hope that somewhere there is a holy grail of what actually was said, and that when we get there, we will know for sure. Luther wouldn't agree with that. We already know for sure because Jesus showed us that on the cross. No amount of reinforcement, of additional detail, is going to change the basic relationship between God and humankind. We know now, as I mentioned before, that many early Christian religious writings didn't become scriptural, that for one reason or another they got left on the side. And sometimes, they are discovered, and we can read them and learn about a world that has vanished. Because even then, and all through the story of Christianity, God's people have been sorting out different claims to truth and testing them against the standard of what God did for us in Christ. I also said that every time we find a new piece of text from the ancient world, we learn something new about how the ancient languages were used. That helps us revise our own translations to see if we have chosen the best way to express those ideas today. We wouldn't care about this if the scriptural texts weren't so important to us. But our curiosity and our hope for ever more information shouldn't tempt us to think that we are somehow closer to God's truth when we do expert exegesis today than when we or anyone in the 2,000 year history of Christianity has read the Bible or listened to a sermon. God has always been with us. God has always been there, close to us, with the message, the same message of love and forgiveness. It is a deep and dangerous temptation to confuse the way we know scientific facts through theory and testing with the way we know divine truths through ancient stories and the work of the Holy Spirit. But we moderns are tempted that way all the time to think that the truths of the experienced world are better and in some way truer than the revealed truths our hearts cherish. That they are not the same is certain. They don't do the same thing. You can't heal a broken heart with a bypass operation. You can't cure congestive heart failure with a passage from Scripture, no matter how firmly believed. And most of us know this instinctively, that we live both and at the same time in a material reality that changes very fast and in a spiritual reality that changes not at all. 
The challenge for us is not to confuse the two and try to use the wrong answers to the right questions. We will never know God the way we know the world around us, and it would be vain to try. But we will also actually never understand the way the universe works, and especially why. Why is it all here? We will never know this with the same deep certainty that we can know that God loves us. And this is the point at which these two kinds of knowledge, so different from each other, converge a bit somehow. Because the unknowable story of God and God's creation, of which Christianity and the Bible are only a part, are somehow unexplainably the same unknowable story of the material creation of all that is in our universe and beyond. God is in both. God's truth exists in a different dimension than the truths that humans can know by themselves alone. So how do we use the Bible then to teach us, to teach us how to live? This is where I think we struggle the most. Most of us understand God's promise of mercy and forgiveness as one that calms our fears and guides our hearts. We also know in the ways Jesus taught us and Luther re-emphasized that we should reflect the love of God we feel back onto those with whom we live. To love God is to love our neighbor. We get that. In a general way, Scripture teaches us this in many, many instances. But how do we use the Bible in our lives? The first way, I would say, is that we can use it to gain greater understanding of the complexity of the human heart. And along with that, the complexity of our own hearts. The story of God and God's people, the Bible contains, is one that isn't, for the most part, extremely flattering to God's people. They are shown as self-centered and selfish, easily tempted and prone to shame, impatient, envious, and in turn, timid and arrogant. And that's just Adam and Eve. <laughs> the story doesn't get more attractive after that. We neglect what God gives us. We conspire to take from each other what we envy. We long to be lifted up as more important than others to be richer or more powerful or more loved. We are sometimes full of hubris and sometimes flat out despairing. Even our faith in God can be self-serving or self-righteous or hypocritical. And sometimes we kill each other. And yet, and yet God loves us and shows us patience and mercy and affection. Within the microcosm of our own little self-centered lives, where we are caught in a cycle of despair and hope that we can't escape from in this life, the scriptures witness to us a larger reality, a macrocosm of God's care of God's love that surrounds us and is shown most powerfully in the rich abundance and diversity of creation and in the compassion of the life and death of Jesus. These are the two great dramas that Scripture presents to us, the drama of an amazing creation and the drama of an extraordinary sacrificial redemption. 
This is where we live. Caught up in ourselves and yet held tightly by God. So what do we do with that? First, I think it's important for us to be realistic. We are what we are. Life will always be a struggle with self-centeredness. But we are also born into families and bound into communities and caught up in a wider society around ourselves. So we live in several dimensions at once. We live for ourselves, we live with others, and we live in the face of God, all at the same time. Each of these makes some demands on us. And we learn from Scripture, from the deep stories of humanity, how challenging it is to live these lives, and how many ways there are for us to do it wrong. But we also learn to cherish and protect those we love. We learn to be grateful for what we're given, and how to offer what we have for the benefit of others. For those who are oppressed, the Bible is a story of liberation for God's people, beset by enemies and injustice, taken from one land to another against their will. It is no wonder that people bent under the yoke of slavery would take these stories to their heart as their own stories. The greater challenge for us who don't live in slavery, but in fact in privilege, is to respond to the needs of those around us who are still oppressed by systems and structures, often ones that are invisible to us at first, we who are people of privilege. If there is one moral teaching of the scripture, it is this that we should take up the burdens of others and not add to them. In fact, sometimes I wish Bibles had warning labels. <laughs> Maybe they should have some use only as directed instructions <laughs> to prevent an accidental overdose which might lead you into thinking your mind is God's mind. We've all done that. Or, more likely, we've seen somebody else do it. We've seen somebody so eager to smite the unrighteous with the jawbone of an ass that they forgot it was their own jawbone. <laughs> Or that maybe at least our Bibles should have a do no harm sticker on them to make sure that we don't get carried away with the power of God to think that we're entitled to judge others. We know this, but I think sometimes we need to say it out loud that it is never right to use the scriptures to justify a prejudice that you are bringing to it. And that for the most part, the impulse to look it up in the Bible to reinforce your side of a disagreement <laughs> is almost never a good idea. <laughs> we don't use Scripture against each other. We study it together to understand together what it might be teaching us. And there probably ought to be a little bit of fine print in the back of the book for pastors, reminding them and all of us that lifting up the gospel hope the Bible contains is the whole reason for our preaching. I advertise this lecture with the provocative idea that the Bible is one thing and not another. It is the source of our faith and not its object. And as I draw this presentation to a close, I want to return to that idea for a minute. For it is crucial, if we are to be faithful to the Lutheran tradition we claim, 
that we understand the risks we run in making God's story too much about ourselves. And in our claims for the Bible's authority, turn it into an idol to be worshipped instead of a lesson to be learned. Martin Luther spent his whole career interpreting the Bible, but he never saw it as something that could be completely explained or understood. He returned to the Bible every day as a source of wisdom and revelation without making its contents into something that they weren't. Luther was also only human, and his interpretations were colored by his experience and his context just as ours are, but he never forgot that the word of God that saves us is not the scriptural text, but the word made flesh, Jesus Christ, revealing God to us most completely, most perfectly. We have and we cherish the Bible because it shows us Christ. That is what the scriptures are for. They are not for us to use against each other, but a place where we and all the people of God, as individuals and as the church, can return again and again to find Christ, to find God revealed in the complexity and messiness of human life. May that also be true for us today. To those of you who are on the live stream, we will sign off now but your leaders have some questions you might wish to discuss. And here in the Lutheran Center at Glendale, I thank you for being with us. Please hang around and we can talk some more too. is we'll use in our liturgy at the end of our readings of scripture the uh, the reader will often say the word of God or the word of the Lord and we will respond thanks be to God um, this is a, a ritual exchange and very ancient in its origins um, I do not think it is intended to underscore the absoluteness of the clarity of the message of scripture we've just heard or to give it an entire endorsement as being by itself um, the understanding for everyone in that moment of what God intends for us. But as Dominic suggested, to say for us that we consider this important, that this is a meaningful text, it is part of the tradition of Scripture. I personally... Yes, sir. What's the nature of divine inspiration and in creating Scripture? Is it available today? Can there is a... Them? It has always been debatable, so there's no reason it shouldn't be debatable today. Um, oh, the question is uh, the nature of, of the understanding of divine inspiration of Scripture. The doctrine, this is a doctrine by which Christians have interpreted and explained how Scripture has the authority it does. From Lutherans have participated in this conversation very enthusiastically. Um, over the course of a, a number of years. It's not such a, a hot topic at the moment, but in the first hundred years after the Reformation, it was especially important, especially among Protestants, to define in, in clear ways how they thought and why they thought Scripture alone should be the authority for all true manifestations of Christianity. And I say that because it's the context out of which it comes that makes it so important. There's a second development in the late 19th century and early 20th century in which these mostly 16th and 17th century definitions of how scripture works get revisited in a later age. And what had happened in between is the development of a historical critical method of biblical study, which looked at the texts of the Bible not as uh, sort of untouchably sacred, but subject to the same kind of critical and editorial analysis as any ancient text, that you would deal with the texts uh, about Jesus in this, as, a, as scholars in the same way as you would deal with the texts about Plato, 
that the, all of the equipment of philology, the study of ancient languages, of linguistics, and all the new sciences of the understanding of human communication would be applied to the study of scripture too. And it, this was a natural development because scripture, of course, is the most important set of texts in the Christian world. And so that scholars, theologians, and, uh, and uh, language scholars would focus on the scriptures is natural. And much of what we know today about the background of the scriptural texts comes out of that work done in the middle of the 19th century. Many, of, many people, though, assumed that somehow to subject these holy texts to a kind of literary form of criticism was to, dis, to diminish them or to handle holy things with secular tools. And, uh, and so there was a controversy at the time about the appropriateness of this, whether everything that the scripture said should be claimed as being equally, uh, tr equally well understood by everyone of the same spirit. Lutherans were, have been involved in this question because we, had a, we not only had a stake in the game of definition because Luther had insisted so strongly on Scripture being primary, but because we had a slightly different way of understanding how Scripture works, how the work of the Holy Spirit informs the Scriptures. And so for among traditional <coughs> Lutherans, at least, these issues weren't as hotly contested as they were among Calvinists and Lutherans of a more rationalistic type, where the currency of the debate, the framework of the discussion, was all about issues of certainty. How could you define uh, a certainty that was satisfying to everyone? And this is a, a logical exercise to some degree. Um, the defining of certainty is a little bit what I talked about in, in my references to science. It was an attempt to nail things down, which for Luther weren't capable of being nailed down because he didn't live in that kind of intellectual framework, but which in a new and increasingly scientific age seemed important. The people were uncomfortable with the ambiguity of having two kinds of truth, for example. And so defining, for example, words like inerrant, which Luther never used, become part of the currency of talking about scripture. But it's, no one ever doubted that scripture contained the truth about God in a way that was absolutely sufficient and necessary to the faith. What they were trying to do was to say that the, tr that the inspiration of scripture moves it into a special category that makes it not subject to the same interpretive tools as other kinds of human knowledge, which were seen as partial. So, in a way, it's reflecting that gulf between what it means to be human and what it means to know God that I was talking about, but in a very focused way. And in the 19th century and early 20th century, especially in the English-speaking world, this is largely a phenomenon of the English-speaking world, mm -hmm. um, the debate became very intense among Protestants about sort of who believed in the scriptures more absolutely and certainly. And uh, I would say a kind of a spitting match, let's say, <laughs> among Protestants about whose fidelity to Scripture was more intense and sued. That's not one that has tended to occupy us since then. Um, it was, in a way, a kind of an anti-modern move that has been left largely behind. But it has created within American Protestantism, it has had a, a, a deleterious legacy in that it has created a corner of American Protestantism in which absolute understandings of the Bible as an entire unitary document without much regard to the complex story of how the Bible comes about is seen as complete and perfect in itself and uh, self-sufficient testimony to God's intentions about everything, which is not a position Lutherans would take because for us, the Holy Spirit is always an essential component of any true understanding of what Scripture means. So Lutherans cannot really, by definition, be fundamentalists. That's not the way our understanding of Scripture works. We have, there are other many more narrow definitions of that. That's kind of a semester's worth into itself.
but we, for the most part, avoid the question of, uh, of how true are parts of Scripture. How true is the Scripture as, as a whole, and how do we understand that truth in relation to other kinds of experienced truth? Sorry, that's a really long answer to a simple question. But the fact is, this is really the least simple aspect of the whole question, is what was God's intention? We know what God's intention was in saving humankind and sending Jesus Christ. What Was there a special intention that God had in the composition of Scripture? That's much less clear, and it certainly wasn't clear to Luther. But funny, in a funny way, it has become more clear to some Christians, the more modern we get. The comment was that when we make the Bible about ourselves, we make it into an idol, and that's entirely true. I wouldn't contest that in the least. The odd thing, though, about this inerrancy debate is that it's an attempt to make it about ourselves without making it about ourselves. By claiming it being about God alone, separate from us, we are making a truth claim that then cannot be assailed, in a sense. So there's a paradox involved. And that's why, I, for, for us, the inerrancy question has never really been a very fruitful one. Because to be inerrant means to be able to nail something down from a human perspective more than we believe the ability of humans exists to do that. And uh, if there were something inerrant, we would not recognize it, because we are not capable of that. It's outside our our uh, ken. So to call something inerrant is just to uh, is to place a kind of Trump label. Trump, I mean, tr in the sense of Trump card. Sorry, it's not. Uh, another part of my vocabulary that has had to be limited. Um, it's to it's to raise something to a to an untouchable level of authority that is essentially reaching onto a shelf that is too high for humans to reach. So at least that would be my metaphor. It doesn't mean we don't love the Bible. We do. It informs everything we are and everything we have and our whole faith. And I'm grateful to you all for being here to listen to me talk about it. Next time, we're going to talk about the relationship between God, Jesus, and the Spirit and how we understand God. <coughs> we're, getting, we're moving from Scripture alone, or Scripture first, into a theological discussion in which Scripture will still be foundational but which does use more of the way that humans have experienced the world as ways of uh, understanding the work of God in our midst.